It's Richard Ellis Talks with founding pastor of Reunion Church in the heart of downtown Dallas, Richard Ellis. Whether you find yourself in a good place or a difficult place, perhaps even in a very lonely place, you've come to the right place, a place to hear that you matter, to hear that you're loved, and that's something everyone desperately needs to hear. Now, if you're not able to enjoy today's entire program, just go to the website, richardellistalks.com. All of these video talks plus hundreds of audio talks are waiting to encourage you, challenge you, and to give you hope at richardellistalks.com. So with today's talk, here's Richard Ellis. The title of today's message is, That Ain't Right. It is impossible in our world sooner or later not to come across something, some situation, something you read about, something you see, something you hear about, and you just kind of shake your your head and kind of say, man, that ain't right. Uh, I do believe there are times and more times than not when we have a responsibility to speak up, though. And a lot of times throughout history, things that people would say, that ain't right, and just stand by and let it be wrong, and don't ever speak to it. Don't ever risk being on the wrong side um, of pressure or prejudice or whatever it may be going on in the world. Think, well, if I say that, I'll be out of business or I'll be shunned or canceled or whatever it is. I encourage you to be bold, to be brave. And when you see something and you feel or literally say that ain't right, uh, speak to that. One of my favorite stories, and if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 50, we're not going to read the whole story um, and I probably talk about Joseph too much. Uh, this guy is the bomb. He's not a preacher. Turns about to be one of the, the 12 tribes, a leader of one of the 12, 12 tribes of, of Israel. And uh, he, he suffers massive injustice at the hands of his own family. His brothers um, don't like him. He's had some dreams as a child. Turns out all those dreams would come true what he's been saying, and uh, they sell him into slavery. He ends up um, being bought by a guy named Potiphar, runs this guy's house. His wife is chasing him around the house almost every day. You know, lie with me, lie with me, and he won't do it. And then finally one day she accuses him of trying to make some advance toward her. He ends up in the king's prison, not a common prison, so he's gone from being a slave, he's owned, he could have been killed at that point. I think the Potiphar knew who he was and who, is, who he was married to. So he ends up in prison. Before long, he's running the prison. And you say, well, how could, how could God possibly have chosen this guy and have all these plans for this guy when, if, when at any, any given moment in his life you see the slices and you go, whatever dream he had, this is a nightmare. There's nothing coming of that. There's nothing gonna. There's nothing gonna come of that. I encourage you that when you find scripture, when God puts something on your heart, hold on to what He tells you. You say, "But my circumstances." Truth is not. Um, you can't let your your circumstances affect your truth. Because either God is who he says he is and he can do what he says he can do or he can't. You say, well, what I see, faith is not about what you see. It, it's, it gives evidence to things that you cannot see, things down the road. So I've looked repeatedly. You cannot find one verse of Joseph complaining, whining, woe is me, nothing, this is not fair, this isn't right. Whatever God had allowed, he was going to allow for that. And after he is sold into slavery, owned by Potiphar, runs a prison, within a matter of hours, you see in the story, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. From being running a prison to prime minister of Egypt, 30, uh, 30 years old, he's running the entire nation. You say, how is that possible? If you spend your time even in situations that are not right, Letting God use that cauldron, that pressure cooker of a situation to turn you into the person that he wants you to be, then at 30, you might be ready to be prime minister of Egypt. But if you had spent all those 30 years whining and complaining and griping that this isn't fair, this isn't right, and why did this happen to me, you're not sharpening your sword. You don't have the skills you need. And God says, you know what? I have allowed this in their life or I've allowed it in your life for a reason. Trust me. 
Trust me. But this isn't right. This isn't fair. Trust me. And before we're done today, you'll see that plenty of stuff happened to Jesus that was not right and was not fair. Now, in Genesis 50, after all this, and I I really recommend you go back and read the book of Genesis in this context and see really what happened. There's a famine. Joseph's the prime minister. He's prepared for this for the nation and those around. And God uses him in that place, in that foreign land, to rescue his entire family. And their dad has died, and they're they're terrified that Joseph is going to do something bad to them, and they deserve it. But in Genesis 50, verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Um, That is an option. And they weren't sure that that wasn't the option. And what did they say? He will hate us and actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. I don't recommend option one. And there are people in this room and beyond here You've gone with option one. And whatever's happened to you, you hate that person or those people, and you have set out to repay them for what they've done. And all that's doing is is screwing your life up. It's not doing anything to them in many cases. And I've shared this before, how many people I've sat through with the years, and they sit there and tell me stuff, heinous stuff that's happened to them. And they go through all this, and they're going to make the person pay, and I remind them gently as I can you know that the person you hate and are trying to get vengeance on has been dead for 10, 20 years. Who who are you you trying to hit? No one's paying but you. You suffered enough. Why are you suffering more trying to make them suffer and they're not even here anymore? So they, will he hate us and actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him? So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, these are brilliant messages, Send this message. Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespasses of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Um, That's a good message to send, right? From dad, and he's deceased. Now please forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph went when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And that's part of what he saw in his vision when he was a kid, that they would bow to him. And look what he says. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Uh, if you let God be God, then he is a judge. If you decide you're going to be God, now you've got to be the judge. And if you're the judge, then you can pardon, forgive, sentence, whatever, condemn. You're not the judge. I'm not the judge. You say, but these people are getting away with it. I know this is very disturbing, and and on the the category of that ain't right, you see a situation and you say, that ain't right. Somebody's got to fix that situation or that person. They're getting away with terrible stuff. Never forget that God is God, and people tend to reap what they sow. And not to make, this is not to make it even be worse than it's going to be, but you say, well, I've dreamed up some consequence for this evil person. The consequence that you, could, that you can contrive could not possibly be worse than what God has for them. Now, here's where it gets dangerous for us if we are not willing to forgive we start dreaming up stuff for people and are eaten up with wanting to see this come to pass on them um, so bad that literally we take on a to hell with them attitude, a literal to hell with them. Now you hate them so much that you want them to spend eternity separated from God in hell. You don't want to, you don't want to hate anybody that much. That's not good for you. It's not just bad for them. It's not good for you. You don't want that. Now, if that's what someone chooses and that's where they end up, then uh, trust me, whatever they did to anybody on the planet that ain't right is going to come back on them. And if you really understood what was going to hit them, you would pray God have mercy on their soul because you don't want anybody to end up in hell. So Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Verse 20, but as for you, you meant evil against me but God meant it for good 
in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. If you look back over your life and you had been told before you were born that this was going to be your life, some of it your choices, some of it things that had happened, that had happened to you, would you sign up for this life? You say, well, no, there's been terrible things that happened. What if he's not done yet? You say, well, I don't have enough faith for that. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know, but I'm mad. And what's that going to accomplish? I'm going to be angry. That's what you're going to be, angry, bitter. Or you're going to say, Lord, we didn't get to have that meeting, but I do know this. I got born. A lot of people don't get born, and I've lived to this point, and a lot of people don't make it very far. And on top of all that, if you're a Christian, you saved me. So no matter what has happened before or what happens next, I know if I die and when I die, I will spend eternity with you in heaven. So that's settled. Now, why have you allowed this? Why am I still here? And what am I going to do about that? And then you start asking God to use all the atrocities, all the suffering, all the pain, all that stuff. Say, Lord, somehow show me how you were trying to do this. You meant it for evil against me, meaning the world maybe that's harmed you, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, 11 says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So when you're accused of something that you did not do, especially as a Christian, and you are falsely accused for taking a stand or whatever it is, the cat, whatever the category, whatever you've said or done, and they revile and persecute you, what is your first reaction going to be? Wow, I am so blessed. What a blessing. Is that our reaction? For most people, that is not our reaction. We want to retaliate. We want to say something back. And, and here it goes. That's where the fight started. Uh, when do you get to the point where someone, you hear those words, the reviling, the persecuting, you go, oh, wow, what a blessing. I prayed that God would bless me today, and he just did. you got to be a little ways down the road for that to kick in when, this, when these things happen. But to realize, wow, they did it to him, they're going to do it to me. I'm blessed. So part of what I've been processing this category for a while now is all the injustice in the world. I'm okay, well, what happened to Jesus? And how is it that God allows these injustices, and we go back to Joseph, what you intended you know, for evil, God meant for good and saved a bunch of people. So how, how does this work? Is it possible that God in his sovereignty literally has built injustice and corruption allowed for it in the system? And the answer is absolutely, because he knows it's part of the system. Look at... Um, Matthew 27, 54. And you get the feeling that they know this. Uh, so when the, this is Jesus on the cross, it's all gone down. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the Son of God. In other words, this ain't right. Something t has gone terribly wrong. This, he said that's who he was. It turns out that's who he says he was. This is not right. The biggest injustice in the history of the world, Jesus dying on a cross, an innocent man, innocent God in our place. Go to Mark chapter 14. And this is before they had him up on the, on the cross. Um, the process to even get him arrested and crucified. Mark 14, verse 55. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. So they are literally, it's not like they've got a case. They're trying to build a case by finding some evidence against him that they can bring forward. So they're literally looking for testimony against Jesus so that they can kill him. Not let's find justice, let's kill him and figure out some way to get him dead. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. So plenty of people showed up and bore false testimony, lied, said stuff that wasn't true. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Uh, clearly they didn't know what he was talking about, but they used that against him. 
But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing what it is that these men testify against you? So how did they get Jesus on the cross? Lies. And ultimately, you know, just injustice after injustice. Barabbas is let go. He's a criminal. He should be strung up. And they say, let Barabbas go. Crucify, crucify, crucify. Um, Luke 23. So Jesus is crucified uh, with two thieves. He's in the middle of two criminals and one on one side gets saved right before he dies and the other one goes, whatever, basically. You know, if you're the son of God, save us, save yourself. Like, doesn't believe. The comment that one of the thieves makes in 2341, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. In other words, the thief says, this ain't right. This man has done nothing wrong. He should not be dying today. But knew beyond, not only was he not guilty of anything, understood who he was, and goes on to say, um, remember me. And he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, You say, well, so you can get saved at the last minute. Yeah, you can. I don't recommend it. Because you don't know when the last minute is. And you'd have to know somehow to time your death and get saved right before you die. You don't know that. You're, You're playing with fire. As soon as you can, get saved. As soon as you hear his voice, respond. And if it's today you hear his voice, do not harden your heart and say one day. This is one day and you may only have one day and this may be your one day. I recommend responding. Romans 8. Um, Big verse in the scriptures. Romans 8, 28. And what does it say? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So let's back into the scripture. Are you called according to his purpose? Is that you? And if the answer is yes, the next question then backing in is, do you love God? then if you are called according to his purpose and you love God, then if you keep backing into it, then what do you know? All things work together for good. It doesn't mean everything is good. It means it works together for the good. And who knows this? We know this. But we forget this. And then we start looking at the situation and going, that ain't right. And maybe it's not. But beyond saying that ain't right, you say, okay, Lord, but I know you have a way of making it right. I trust you. You are sovereign. You're going to bring some good from this. I can't wait to see how this works out. Romans 12. A few more and we're done. Romans 12. And I referenced this earlier, Romans 12, 19. Beloved, so this is written to Christians. Now look at what it says. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So be careful. Um, I've heard some horrible stories about terrible things happening to children, especially girls, and a man or some men in that family going to get revenge on that situation and do harm to the person that harmed the child uh, or the woman. You say, well, that's just that's the way the world works. It doesn't work. You say, well, but we took matters in our own hands. We, we solved it. In rage, you solved it. You said, we got justice. That's not how the world's supposed to work. Um, you go stringing up everybody you got issues with, uh, there'd, be, there'd be people hanging from every overpass in Dallas. 
right? Because we, we want justice. We want to get them. We want something bad to happen to them. Do not avenge yourselves. The second that kicks in and you say that ain't right, but I'm going to fix it, you become God, you become the judge, now you're the ex executioner, you're everything. And now your brain, the wheels kick in to say, I'm going to make this right. And let me tell you, you are not going to make this right. And prisons are filled with people who said, I don't care what happens to me, that guy did that to my child, I'm going to go kill them, and if they arrest me and put me in prison, I don't care. If they execute me, I don't care. I'm going to get justice. That's not the way you get justice. And it's possible that people in this room and beyond are eaten up with this. It says do not avenge yourself, and that's exactly what you've done. You've said this ain't right. I'm going to make it right. And you have consumed your whole life with trying to get revenge on someone. What is the alternative? But rather give place to wrath. It doesn't mean you can't be angry. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Are you okay with what God comes up with that is just? You say, well, what if he goes easy on him? Let me tell you where you, where you don't want him not going easy. Has he gone easy on you? Has he gone easy on me? In the things that I've done? Now, it's very hard to just put it in the hands of an almighty God unless you trust him. And as I said earlier, you say, well, I'm, God, I want you to get that person. Don't cross the to hell with you line or then, now you're back in trouble again. I highly recommend not wishing hell on anyone. You really don't want that. You may feel that. You really don't want that. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5. And this is the that ain't right of all that ain't rights. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you, implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So how, how did it work on the cross? He who knew no sin, even the thief on the cross, the soldiers, something's gone terribly wrong. He didn't deserve to die. This perfect spotless, unblemished Lamb of God who knew no sin literally became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The ultimate, that ain't right. But because that ain't right situation was allowed, now things have been made right between us and God. And the, the righteousness that I would never have had on my own in the same way that sin was imputed to him and he became sin, then what he had becomes mine, righteousness. And now I can stand before God and be seen by God in the same way that he sees his son. Pure as the driven snow, though your sins are scarlet, white as snow. So you say, well, that ain't right. But thank God, it's been made right. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for even injustice in the world and that you are sovereign and that these atrocities, heinosities, um, just straight up evil, Lord, that has occurred in the world and, and even now goes on, you allow for some reason and we are not you, we don't understand. You are sovereign and you work it all together for the good. Um, but as it turns out, the only people that see it working together for the good are those that love you and are called according to your purpose because of the world, it doesn't make any sense. So um, I pray, Lord, for people who are struggling with these issues personally, maybe something they've done, something that happened to them, and they're processing it, something they've seen happen somewhere else, and they are willing to literally be separated from you for eternity 
because they refuse to trust a God that allows things to happen like this. And I pray that you would open their ears, open their eyes, open their heart, Lord, and not risk being separated from you for eternity just because they don't understand something that you allowed. So for anyone, Lord, in this room or beyond who would say, God, I realize no matter what's going on in the world, I know in my own heart, my own life, I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead to offer me the forgiveness of my sins, eternal life as a gift, all of it a gift. I accept the gift of eternal life. I accept the forgiveness of my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead and I want you alive in me. Come live in me, through me, change me from the inside out and show me, Lord, how the world works your way. Teach me to trust you, to follow you. No matter what I see, help me see who you are and what you're up to and see beyond what I see to what the future holds and how you use all of these things and work them together for my good and for your glory. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me and for moving into my life. And I pray now that you would bring honor and glory to yourself through me. Father, for those of us who are believers already, maybe we've gotten hung up on something that we've done or that has happened to us or that we've seen that, that ain't right. And we don't understand but we cannot lock up our entire lives, Lord, and not follow you and not trust you and not obey you just because we don't understand and can't see what you're up to. So Lord, stir within us that faith that is required to move us forward, where we would depend on you, where we follow you, even when we can't see what's up, um, and realize that you, you are working these things together for the good. Father, thank you for being patient with us, for being merciful, for being just. Um, but that the justice that we deserved and it was coming our way landed on Jesus. And because of that, we did not get what we deserved. We got what we could never deserve or ever be or have. And that is your righteousness imputed to us. And we thank you for that. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We trust you. And we ask you to use the scriptures, Holy Spirit, to not only speak to us, but better enable us to, sp to speak to others, that you would speak through us to a world that is hurting and needs hope. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'd love to keep this conversation going with you anytime on the website richardellistalks.com. There you'll find the full version of today's talk, plus hundreds more of Richard's challenging and encouraging audio and video talks. Then discover over a thousand cities where Richard Ellis Talks is broadcast. Or you can share a request on the prayer wall. Plus, if you'd like to consider a gift, learn how to join the financial partnership team and so much more at richardellistalks.com. So let's meet again here next time to talk about how God is ready to change your life starting today with Richard Ellis Talks.